Good morning, everyone. Hi. My name is Stephanie Simmons. I go by Steph, um, for those of you who know me socially. And there's, like, always surprises me who I see when I come to these. There's always one or two people who I didn't expect from different corners of life. So today it's Sueno Sensei. Hi, Sueno. Nice to see you, um, who instructs my daughter in judo. And, uh, and my friend Mark uh, from the bus stop. Uh, where are you, Mark? There you go. Our kids go to the same school, right? Yeah. So it's fun. And, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to be here with all of you. That's a good title for a book from the bus stop. From the bu- Tales from the bus stop. <laughs> the, dra- the drama, the drama. And you want TikTok dances. Oh, yeah. the, the fourth grade set is, is really <laughs> yeah. he, he does TikTok uh, for, uh, and just what's the sport called? Uh, CrossFit. <laughs> no, which is just going to jump off on this table. But I'm going to capture that. Uh, I think I have that box jump, actually. Yeah, I think I think I got that one. Way, uh, I would encourage people to use your cameras for social media. We can post on anything you like. Uh, and uh, I also passed out some white cards. I'd like you to write down on those cards things that you think about uh, that and come out of this group yeah. or any that you're practicing. And we're going to post those for Dr. Rob on Monday. So uh, please sub, write something in now, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you. Could interrupt. That's all right. So um, I was thinking about how to frame my remarks this morning and uh, which, which of the many threads of my story around mind, body, and spirit to pull uh, for, for my remarks. And I guess I'll start with my decision to go to medical school which was not an easy one. In fact, uh, as an undergrad at University of Michigan, I was a history, uh, history major and ended up applying to medical schools, PhD programs in epidemiology, genetic counseling, and graduate programs in history um, all together. And I, I figured only one of those uh, graduate programs would let me in and that would make the decision for me. Um, I heard the phone was the show. That is the only time anyone has ever said that to me. Usually they're like, can you stop? (laughs) Sure, thank you. So I ended up uh, having a tough decision to make, even at the last minute, and decided on medical school because I thought that that was the place where I could most use my talents to make a difference in the world. And growing up, that was our family motto. Doesn't matter what you end up doing, as long as you end up doing something where you can use your talents to make the world a better place. If your talent is art, be an artist. If your talent is engineering, be an engineer, right? And I thought it was pretty good at talking to people and, uh, and pretty good at STEM, right? Pretty good at science. So I decided medicine was the thing for me. And um, through the course of medical school, I decided to be an anesthesiologist because I really liked the procedures. I really liked the physiology, and I like the fact that anesthesiologists get to take care of everybody, um, from birth to death, babies, pregnant people, um, everyone. And so I matched into an anesthesiology residency, and I was doing my rotating internship in the emergency department, and um, I fell in love. I fell in love. I had already married my high school sweetheart by that time, so this was the second time I fell in love. Um, but I fell in love with emergency medicine. My first shift as an ER resident, I, um, I went into a room and I saw somebody who wasn't breathing and I um, resuscitated them and intubated them and came out and talked to my attending and said, yeah, I just, you know, I intubated the guy in room 17. And they said, you what? <laughs> and so um, apparently that wasn't normal for an off-service resident. And, um, especially because he was in for dermatology. Yeah, especially, especially for that rash, right? Yeah. But it just, I loved the opportunity to intervene with someone on their worst day, make a difference, and, um, and, and hopefully it mattered that I was the one that was there that day. And so I switched residencies and started all over again and uh, started in emergency medicine. During my residency training program, uh, in my second internship, I had my first child, who is now a freshman at University of Michigan, go blue. It's all one sentence, always. And, um, and during my fourth year of residency, had my second child, uh, who is here today, Vivian. I know this is the second time you're getting called on, but if you just put your hand up. Um, and so 
<laughs> very low. So it was. Uh, Ran into. Yeah, it was a busy time. It was a busy time. Uh, this was right around the time when the work hours for residency were changing from unlimited to only 80 uh, a week. And so, uh, you know, every third day you're, you're up for 30 to 36 hours. And you're learning a new language, Latin-based, but its own jargon. And you are learning a professional code of ethics on how to be in the world. And you are witnessing some of the worst human suffering imaginable. I was raised in northern Michigan and came to Ann Arbor for school and uh, had experienced those settings by the time I was a resident in emergency medicine, practicing um, in Ypsilanti in Ann Arbor and also in Flint, Michigan. And you see a lot of things and you experience a lot of things and you learn a lot about people and some of those lessons are really hard. In my, um, in my third year of residency, when I had a two and a half year old at home and I was pregnant um, with Vivian, I took care of a three year old uh, child who came in uh, not breathing and with cardiac arrest and worked harder, I think, on that little girl than on any patient I'd ever tried to resuscitate. And unfortunately, we didn't get her back. Um, that was the first hardest case, not the last, just the first. And I spent a long time um, comforting her mother afterwards, really thinking about and putting myself in her place and what that pain and agony would feel like. I experienced my own discomfort, pain, uh, about that case four months later when I was called to testify at the murder trial um, of that little girl where her mother was the defendant. And that reckoning of having to grapple with the fact that um, this woman was in loss and pain, who I was comforting, but also had perpetrated this child's death, um, was in a lot of ways a loss of innocence for me. Right? In, in the way I interacted with medicine, in the way I viewed people, and in the way I viewed my role um, in the emergency department. So I said that was my first really hard case, but there were many. Um, humanity is a mixed bag. And there are a lot of amazing, wonderful high notes in dealing with people at their worst days and their, la and their last moments. And there are a lot of low notes. And one of the things that doesn't happen in your preparation for medical school or in medical school or in residency is, um, is developing a toolkit on how to deal with those events and those traumas. I like to think of them as a backpack that you carry around with you. And every time something like that happens, you know, your next patient is waiting to be seen, right? And they need you. They need you at your best. And so you put it in the backpack and you walk on to the next patient and you take, maybe, maybe that's just a pebble that you're throwing in your backpack from that person or maybe it's a whole nother 45 pound plate, right? But you end up with this very full backpack and eventually, you're going to tip over and you're going to land on your back like a turtle. If you don't take that backpack off and unpack it every once in a while and talk about what's happening in your life and what you're going through. But nobody teaches you how to unpack that backpack. And far from being encouraged to do that in medicine, you are actively discouraged by the stigma of mental health care in the healthcare professions. So I want to talk a little bit about the sources of that stigma and what I decided to do with that in my own career. When I think about stigma of seeking mental health care, and I'm talking about anything from seeing a therapist to receiving mental health care, being on a medication, having a diagnosis, there are three sources of stigma. And this is not just for healthcare professionals, it's for everyone, including everyone in this room. The first source is internal, 
what's it mean about me if I need help? Maybe I'm not perfect. What could be worse? <laughs> Maybe um, I can't do everything by myself. And I'll tell you, um, there's two groups that suffer from this phenomenon more than anyone else, and one is healthcare professionals and the other is entrepreneurs. Okay. The second is external stigma. We're afraid what other people are going to say about us. And in healthcare, there's a special thing that happens where we are treating people with substance use disorder and mental health conditions all day long. And one of the ways that healthcare professionals deal with their chronic stress is through dark humor. Well, when you use dark humor, your colleagues are listening and they think about what words and what jokes and what labels will be applied to them when they need help. So that's the second source of stigma. The third is institutional, and you learn very quickly as a medical professional that when you apply for your state license, you will be asked about your history of mental health care. You will be asked if you've ever been diagnosed or treated for any mental health condition or substance use disorder in your entire life, and you will be asked those questions every time you credential at a hospital for the rest of your career. That has a significant chilling effect on health care's workers' willingness to seek mental health care. And so we have a workforce in health care who are carrying around these very heavy backpacks and have all of the barriers put up against them to take those backpacks off and to unpack them with somebody who can help them in a professional way. I don't deal very well with things that I don't think are fair. Um, in fact, there's pretty much no better way to get me riled up than to tell me you can't do that or to say you have to do that and for me to not want to do that. Um, some of you who know me personally might recognize that trait. <laughs> Knowing look at my daughter. <laughs> so um, I, I, was, I was upset by this. I wanted to change it and I slowly started to shift the administrative teaching and research work that I was doing as a physician towards this area of professional well-being for healthcare workers for two reasons. Number one, because it helped me process my own experiences, right, to be healthy physically, mentally, spiritually in my work, but also because it seemed like an injustice. Um, not just for healthcare workers, although that would be enough, but also for their patients who didn't have the opportunity to benefit from healthy healers. So if you've ever interacted with a healthcare worker who seemed like they didn't have the empathy or compassion for you that you wanted, it was probably because they're carrying a backpack that is so full they can't imagine putting even one more thing in it. So um, I transitioned my career to a role caring for the caregivers that I worked alongside, starting about 12 years ago, and for the past seven years had worked as the vice president of patient and clinician experience for a large national medical group. Um, called Envision Physician Services. We have 26,000 physicians um, and APPs that work for us, mostly in emergency medicine, anesthesiology, and hospitalist medicine, critical care. I was doing this work um, in March of 2020 when the COVID pandemic started, and all of a sudden the chronic issues of burnout in healthcare became an acute pandemic of trauma in healthcare. And so in addition to the things that we were already doing, offering additional individual support, coaching, counseling to healthcare workers, we started looking at what we could do extra. And it was around that time uh, that a physician in Manhattan named Dr. Lorna Breen died by suicide. And some of you may have heard her story. Her sister and her brother-in-law were on uh, USA Today 
several times speaking about her story because her death was publicized against the family's wishes with their cause of death less than 12 hours afterwards. And they shared her story of caring for patients in Manhattan during the first wave, of how overwhelmed she was, and how worried she was that she would never be able to practice medicine again because she received mental health care as an inpatient. Corey and Jennifer chose to start a foundation called the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation as a result of their family member's death and dedicated that foundation to reducing burnout in healthcare workers and preventing clinician suicide. Healthcare workers die by suicide at higher rates than almost any other population. Equal rates to veterans. And so um, that work is amazing. I heard about the foundation because one of my coaches on my team was getting his um, MBA at Darden School of Business where Corey Feist uh, was giving a lecture and talking about the foundation. So I called him, cold called him on LinkedIn. I worked, go figure. And um, we had two hour conversation the first time. I said, this is what I'm doing with my career. How can I help? And so we worked, we collaborated on a couple of projects. I joined their board. And uh, last year, for the year of 2023, I was seconded by my organization to be their part-time chief medical officer uh, for the foundation. And as part of that role, was able to uh, author a impact well-being guide with NIOSH, which is the occupational safety wing of the CDC, and lead change in the licensing applications of states so that we went from 17 states that were consistent with best practices not asking about history of mental health uh, substance use disorder but only current impairment to 26 states with 12 more in the process of change. Yeah, so making difference in how healthcare workers are experiencing this. Our goal is 50 plus Puerto Rico and every hospital in the country. So um, this year, I am the full-time chief medical officer of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Foundation, and this is my full-time work going forward. For me, this role has married my willingness to serve, my desire to use my talents to make the world a better place, and the ability to really make an impact um, not only for healthcare workers, but also for patients. And so I wanted to share not only my story, but the story of Lorna and her family in order to, um, to raise awareness around what healthcare workers are facing, but also to celebrate the changes that are happening in terms of those areas of stigma and how um, healthcare workers are viewing themselves, their relationships with their patients. I also want to recognize there are, there are two folks here today, um, Courtney Burns and, and Jess Baker. If you guys could raise your hands or stand up real quick. Um, these two young women are medical students at University of Michigan and are starting the first Michigan chapter of the Dr. Lorna Breen Heroes Student Coalition, um, which has previously been in Virginia. And so there is also a recognition that is new and different among folks who are training about the importance of marrying their mind, their body, and their spirits in this work and staying healthy as they care for others. So thank you for help letting me share my story today. And it's still your mic. I'm gonna take that from you. So, uh, in terms of the cards, this is an opportunity to write down something that, well, just an observation, something to do in which to go to first you'll advise, many people do and think about uh, based on what is wonderful Presentation, deeply moving presentation from Stephanie. Stephanie, you and I have this part of many presentation. I think this is your rear best. And you can really feel it from the heart. And we can hear this mind, body, spirit coming through with all integrated and all the way through the stuff. Thank you. Ooh. Thanks, we add. Gepper, can we do yourself? Sure. First of all, Steph, uh, that was 
impactful because uh, I mean for me so my wife is a nurse as well I know there's a lot of healthcare workers here and uh, everything that you're saying actually resonates very personally with me because I see it secondhand through her so uh, thank you for bringing awareness to that uh, my name is Kemper Sosa I'm with Applied Fitness Solutions and uh, I've had the pleasure of coming to this group for a short time the last few months and Rob said that this panel has been through a lot but I actually haven't been through shit because I'm still a millennial so, <laughs> so, my experience is pale in comparison to these two up here. Um, but a quick backstory around me, and then I do want to get into some uh, some tangible actuals you guys can take away uh, around the physical side of health. But a quick backstory of me: I grew up in a very active family. Got into health and fitness through my mom. Uh, our form of daycare with my brother and I was we would go to her aerobics classes. She was an aerobics teacher, and we'd sit there and watch her do aerobics for four hours uh, on the weekend. So that's how it got infused in me. I studied it in college, got my degree in exercise science through Eastern Michigan University, worked as a personal trainer for a period of time, and then I got connected with uh, Applied Fitness Solutions who the founder is not here, Mike Stack, founded the company. I got on board and fell in love with what we were doing. And fast forward a decade later, here I am partnering with him and trying to spread the gospel. So that's a little back, back story on me. What I want to talk about today is more about physical health, particularly physical activity. And I do see a lot of familiar faces here. So we know healthy guys. See Mary here from Bank of Ann Arbor. A lot of members from uh, Applied Fitness Solutions are here, so that's always cool to see. But as the fitness guy, I'm actually going to talk about how exercise isn't the most important thing to start with. Um, a little thing known as physical activity actually goes a long way. Uh, I'm, the problem with my industry, the fitness industry, is unfortunately we do a very poor job of setting realistic expectations around health and fitness. Uh, in fact, it actually drives a lot of the people away from the industry that actually need it most. So the messaging with fitness is you must train intensely seven days a week. You must have a diet that you follow to without fail. Avoid social interactions. Don't eat out. Sleep nine hours a night. <laughs> All these things that are unrealistic for people like us in this room to actually live the life that we want to live. Many people do that in this room. Yeah. So... Let's get clear on definitions, though, first. Does anybody know the difference between physical activity and exercise? Briefly, anybody? Sid? I mean, I feel like physical activity is just moving your body in any sort of way, whether it's, you know, getting your steps in, and then exercise is like a dedicated routine plan. You're going into the gym. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. 100%. You nailed it. So exercise is a form of physical activity. Physical activity is any bodily movement that we do that requires us to use our skeletal muscles to do it. That could be at the bus stop rocking TikToks, right? That is physical activity. That could be walking. That could be dancing. That could be climbing up and down the stairs. It is unstructured and it is not for a particular goal. Whereas exercise is structured, repetitive movements at a certain intensity that is geared towards a specific fitness goal to improve cardiovascular fitness, to improve muscular strength, muscular fitness. So they are different. A lot of the research that supports health actually links physical activity and people that are more physically active consistently, that's a greater driver of greater health than people that exercise routinely but are sedentary outside of the gym. So that's definitions. Let's talk about the problem that exists where my industry is trying to come in, what this panel is talking about. Uh, there is a, a massive mental health issue that exists. Um, unfortunately, 25% of the American population has some form of a diagnosed mental health disorder, whether it's depression or anxiety. Who knows what the undiagnosed number actually is? Unfortunately, more than half of the population, the adult population, does not adhere to the physical activity guidelines, which is 150 minutes per week of movement. So you think of more than half of our population does not do that. Four out of five children don't adhere to those guidelines. Children, childhood obesity is a massive epidemic that is growing. Um, so then when you think of these scary numbers, like these are people that exist in your life. This is your family. This is your team. This could, I mean, you might even fall in this, this category yourself. Uh, 
so when you think of that, like you think of how, what's the greatest impact that we can have in this room to go back and take to ourselves, our family, and our team, and that is becoming healthier. And I'm here to tell you, you do not have to exercise six days a week to do it. So to build on that, you know, why am I telling you guys this? Um, it's easier than you think to actually make impactful change. To make radical change in your health, all you really need to do is move 10 to 20 minutes per day at a low to moderate intensity. That could be a morning walk to the bus stop. That could be an evening walk outside uh, with your partner after dinner. And doing this can actually take you from poor health to pretty good health with minimal investment of time and energy. So when you're going back um, to your team or to your family or even reflecting on yourself and you're thinking, man, I need to make some health change. I can't go to the gym and do six hours a week of exercise. What can I do? It's less than you think. And the power with this, going from 10 to 20 minutes a day of physical activity, what actually happens, what that means is now your, um, your muscular fitness increases. Your mood elevates. The decrease for depression and anxiety actually goes down dramatically. Um, your sex health improves. Uh, the way your relationships with your team improves. You know, this group being a bunch of leaders in the Ann Arbor area, I know that many of you have small businesses, you have teams that you're working with, maybe you're in HR and you're working with a large organization, you're trying to connect with certain team members. Um, start with yourself. Do a self-assessment on where your current health state is because, like Dr. Steph said, um, the best way that you can impact somebody is bringing your best self forward. And if you are constantly putting your self-care last, you're not exercising, or I shouldn't even say exercising, you're not taking care of your health by moving more, you're not sleeping well, you're not um, talking to anybody about certain obstacles that you're going through, that is going to do uh, damage to your team and your, the impact that you want to have with your organization. So show up as a healthy version of yourself, and that will rip, have a ripple effect to your team down the road. Once that happens, then you can look at your team and those around you, your family, the people that you work with, and then you can begin to identify, hey, do I have team members on my train that are also in poor health here, that aren't physically active, that are sedentary, that are too stressed out, that aren't eating well? What are some things that I can do to help impact my team or those around me to become healthier? Maybe I buy them Dr. Rob's book and have them start reading that. But this is where uh, this is where I do want to shout out a, a partner of ours, Bank of Ann Arbor. Uh, Mike Cole is not here, um, but I know I see a lot of Bank of Ann Arbor faces. Bank of Ann Arbor is a company that does prioritize a healthy culture. So Jim Miller is the steward of this. He's the he's the HR partner that we work with. But this is a perfect example of an organization that prioritizes their team's health and vitality, and in return, they get a much more fulfilling, productive, powerful culture. The team environment is, is thriving, the people are healthier, they feel cared for, their productivity improves, the organization's profits improve. I mean, if you guys have followed Bank of Maine Arbor, I mean, they've been growing. They're not Bank of Maine Arbor anymore. They should be Bank of Michigan. Like, they're going all over the place. So this is just an example of, you know, how health can actually directly impact your leadership abilities and impact your team. And what I would encourage you guys to do to, to take away from today is, one, do a self-reflection on your current health state. Some of you are practicing this and you're doing above and beyond what most people are doing. Some of you are thinking about this and haven't found a good place to start. So do a self-reflection where your current health is and why it matters to you. And then next, where to start, take a 10-minute walk before your work day or in the evening. And if you can do that consistently, five days a week, or I mean even one day a week, you will notice massive health changes that will improve the quality of your life. So... Thank you guys for listening. I hope that was something that you can take away. If you have any questions for me around health or physical activity or fitness, I'll be here every month. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.
Well, thank you. Thank you all. And I really appreciate the messages of both my, my uh, panel partners up here. And I'm going to, I guess, kind of knit it together because I really am on board with the whole get help with stress, not have a stressful workplace, and the whole take care of yourself. Um, I'm Dr. Eric Fretz. I'm a colleague of Dr. Rob's for about 10 years now. We've worked together at the University of Michigan on a variety of uh, thing, classes and initiatives. And I've been a proud member of Leaders Connect all this time and done a couple of those groups and whatnot. I can't say enough good things about them. Learned a lot of good habits and, and uh, techniques, so one of which I'm going to use right now, which is take a little bit of your time for the benefit of others. I'd like to introduce a very special person very quickly, a good friend of mine, Sarah Lauerman. Could you stand up, Sarah? So this is my good friend. She is the partner of a great Army vet friend of mine. Um, she is in the position, like a lot of folks who follow military folks around, of having to move around wherever they go. And in my opinion, she is not only fantastic, but she is underemployed. So if you are looking for someone who has amazing enthusiasm, she has a master's degree, bachelor's, all this stuff, and she's doing some great work in a medical practice, but I think she can do a lot more. And so if there's someone here who is interested in talking to her, maybe you know of an opportunity or you know someone who knows of an opportunity, I would really like to get her working at the top of her game. So if you could help me out with that, I'd appreciate it. And then a number of you, because you know I teach the entrepreneurship minor uh, core practicum at U of M. Uh, a lot of you, uh, my students have come looking to, for you in different ways. I know you just got bugged by one, right? It's a, a project that I have them do. Um, and so I have a group that is doing a really fantastic thing. They are doing a redemption prom because this year is the seniors that didn't get a senior prom. So they're doing a prom for seniors at University of Michigan. And I am so, en I'm so enthralled by this idea. I've already donated. Um, they're looking for a couple of corporate sponsors. If you, this is something you want to get in on, and I think this could end up being pretty big. I think I might get my friend down at Channel 4 to maybe come cover this. I don't know. They're, they're looking for 500 to 1,000 students at this. They've got the Kensington book. But if, you could, if you're interested, please come up and see me. I've got their little flyer, and it would be really great if I could deliver to them a couple more sponsors. That would make me super-duper happy. So thank you very much for letting you do that. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I work full-time at the University of Michigan. I've known Dr. Rob for a long time. I'm going to try to tell you a story about what the last six months have been in my life. I will warn you up front that I may not be able to hold it together. This is not an easy story for me. Um, so if there, were, if there is some emotional decompensation, I apologize. Nobody likes to see the fat man cry, but that's just the way life is sometimes. Um, and so... Yes, there you go. Um, and a lot of you might know the old me. And if you've seen me on LinkedIn, you know, you can search EB Frets on LinkedIn and you can see I, I like to do a lot of things. I've been very busy and I've had a pretty adventurous life from deploying three times across two wars, building a scout camp in the middle of the combat zone in Iraq. I just I like to do fun and exciting and demanding things. But I'm not that guy anymore. I like to say to my friends, I am now the heartless zombie because I shouldn't be here. I should be dead. And I mean, I've had a number of near-death experiences. I almost rolled a van on an ice patch on 94 and ended up in a big snow ditch, and that was great. I almost sank a sailboat and died in the Caribbean. Of course, in Iraq, there was any number of close calls, but this one was different. This one was a Widowmaker heart attack, one that almost nobody survives, particularly if they don't seek care right away. It's basically if you don't get to a hospital, it's 100% fatal. I had mine in a minivan driving through the mountains of Tennessee, and I refused to believe it was a heart attack, and I shrugged it off, took a bunch of it acids, and went to sleep. And that should have been the end for me. But it wasn't, and I'm going to tell you why in the story there. Um, even now, although they have kind of mitigated some of that damage, I am dying of heart failure, and I will not probably live to see my grandkids absent. Maybe a heart transplant. We'll see. Um, but it's a, it's a bit of a mess, right? Oh, this is what the doctors gave me this, right? Chronic heart failure, dilated cardiomyopathy with severe left ventricle systolic dysfunction, left ventricle apical kinesis, left ventricle thrombus over two centimeters, atrial fibrillation with RV. RVR, and an ejection fraction, which means the amount of blood that my heart is putting out is only 20%. But there is no treatment for most of these things. A big portion of my heart is dead. Um, and this is as healthy as I'll ever be. So, you know, this is, it's all downhill, and it's all downhill for all of us, but the big message I'm trying to get across here is it doesn't have to be this way for me, and it didn't have, doesn't have to be this way for me, and it doesn't have to be this way for you if you just sort of pay attention to your body. Um, that's kind of my summary message, right, is that you have a chance to protect yourself. Um, your body's an immense machine, right? You have, an, it, you have reserve capacity in every aspect, right? Your heart is three times as strong as it needs to be. All of you, if you're healthy, could lose 80% of your heart function and still live. I'm living proof, but now I don't have any reserve capacity left, any problems, and that's it for me, right? So you're asking, right, how did we get here? And the, the long story is, well, obviously, I, I've spent my whole life kind of being a sheepdog. That's how my father raised me. I served in the military for 24 years. 
I like helping people, protecting them, and I'm generally willing to suffer at a pretty high level, and I have a really high pain tolerance, which doesn't suit me very well. Um, and I had a very complicated workplace situation where I was trying to protect some people that were being abused, and then that shifted the abuse onto me. This was immensely stressful for me, um, more stress really than I've ever dealt for it. Even, even in combat, I didn't feel this kind of stress. And I knew something was wrong because I would be getting emails from different people involving this drama, and when I would get the email, it would be like I was getting an electric shock. My heart would heave in my chest and I would have to gasp for breath and I just shrugged this off this was going on for a period of almost two years and this was basically a trauma response right but I was sort of denying it and saying oh it's no big deal I can handle it this went on for two years until in 2020 when I was coming back from spring break the stress of heading back to campus was really getting to me I was feeling that in my heart and I threw a clot and it blocked my, le my left anterior descending the L LED which supplies most of your left ventricle and it's 100% blocked, which means that basically that's the end for you if you don't get to a hospital and clear it. And we'll get to the re weird reason why that didn't happen to me. Um, but it was very painful. And I called my wife, who is a doctor, to my undying shame. Not only is my wife a doctor, but I was a Red Cross instructor for 20 years. I taught thousands of people how to detect and respond to a heart attack. And when it actually happened to me, all I could think was, well, it, you know, it's really not the same symptoms. It's probably just really bad heartburn. And I wasn't getting some of the classic symptoms, but not everyone does. And also I had a lot of respiratory, a lot of coughing, and it was right when COVID was happening. So everybody just thought, oh, it's COVID, right? It's just COVID. We got to get home. We don't want to, I don't want to drive an hour into the night. It's two o'clock in the morning. We're going to get, you know, some, some unhappy resident's going to be woken up and have to do a cardio workup on me and it's going to turn out to be indigestion. Everybody's going to be pissed and we're going to be late getting home. All the stupid reasons that I wish I could go back and slap myself in the face about. And so I went to sleep and my friends drove the rest of the way home. And then for the next three years, I had a constant array of increasing symptoms that I just wrote off. All the coughing, the weirdness, I thought it was allergies. So I took tons of allergy medicines and sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. Um, things I couldn't explain or I could explain away at the swelling of my legs. I had to start wearing compression socks. Are my compression sock people? Very popular. For, okay, that happens as you get older, but I'm only 56 years old, and my wife would say that that sort of swelling is an indication of heart, heart, heart stress, you know, and I just, well, I, I just need to exercise more. I just need to lose a little more weight, but I couldn't lose weight because one of the things about heart failure is you start retaining water because your body can't get rid of the salt. The water stays. It compresses your heart. Your heart works less well, and for two and a half years through the middle of, of uh, 2023, I became sicker and sicker and sicker and sicker. My wife would tell me that this wasn't good, um, but I just, I was very stubborn and I'm very good at suffering. And, and my wife will tell you, almost all of her male patients are extremely stubborn and resist seeking health care. Wives in here? Wives in here? Are your husbands stubborn about going to, this is, a, this is a trope that is absolute reality. And I'm going to tell you, I was the living instantiation of that, and it just about ended me. So after all of this, by, by June and July of 23, it was a complete collapse. I couldn't even walk across my own backyard. And when I couldn't walk up the stairs, it took me 10 minutes to get up one flight of stairs. And I said to my wife, I think I'm going to die. We have to do something. And she listened to my lungs, said, I've never, I, I should have listened Earlier, there's so much fluid in here, we have to go to the ER. We went to the ER, and that started off this three-week cycle. And the ER was amazing, and thank you know, I'm really thankful for all the professionals that I dealt with. They said, you do not look good. And they did a test, and they said, oh, that's terrible. Okay, we need to figure out why that is. And then they did another test. They said, oh, that's even worse. And there was this cycle endlessly for two full days, a test. Oh, my God, that's terrible. What happened to you? And they asked me that over and over again. What happened to you? And they didn't have an answer. Because all I just knew that I had been getting gradually sicker for three years. And they kept saying, what happened to you? And finally, after they finally did uh, uh, the catheterization, where they shove a wire up through your body into your heart, and they saw that the LED was 100% blocked, and then they came to my bed and we had the serious discussion. And they were, they were much nicer than this, but basically they were clustered around me and they said, look, you had a Widowmaker heart attack. And basically, you big dummy. And you don't get to sit here and say that you don't know when this happened. And even in that moment, I said to them, well, I really don't know. And my wife in the background, as wives do, uh, excuse me, coming back, Tennessee, 2 o'clock in the morning on Sunday. And I said, oh, God, that was it. That was exactly what it was. And so now, you know, I'm just... I'm getting by, right? They've, they've done a, a great job working on me, but I spend a lot of time in the hospital, and I have to tell you, sitting in that hospital bed, my wife coming in there every day, 
seeing her patients by video in the bathroom of my hotel or in my, my hospital room. And every night when she would say goodnight to me and seeing in her eyes the realization she didn't like this person I had sworn to protect didn't believe that her life could continue after I died, and I had let her down in the most fundamental way, and I can't fix it. So I would do anything to go back in time and make a better decision, but I didn't. So now this is what I have, and honestly, I'm really appreciative of the doctors, because if you look at me, and people who look at me say, Fretz, you look great, and I am. I'm, I'm way, way lighter. I, they, got, they, pump, they, pumped, they pumped 30 pounds of water out of my body. Three gallon milk jugs of liquid were retained in my body, bloating me almost beyond description. I mean, the the things I had let happen to my body, and I was like, oh, it's okay, it's it's okay. Oh. I, the stupidity just galls me, and it's not okay. And I don't, I don't. Maybe maybe you're thinking, I yeah, you won't be as dumb as me, but I really want you to not be. Um, because right now, you know, I have this weird little box. Right, health is this is your health, right? I'm confined to this little box down here. This is death. This is about as high as I can get, this, this point right here. The doctors have done a great job getting me there, right? But I still have crazy things. I, I throw um, sort of fatal heart rhythms, VTAC, all the time. I have a little paramedic robot in my chest now, uh, basically, that watches my heart all the time. There's four different machines. I'm on eight drugs. There's like 10 people I have to answer to at the VA Medical Center. I'm in there every single week. Um, I've still got another procedure coming up. But, you know, they've, they've made it so that I can live my second life but I'd rather have the old life back, right? Um, and here's the, the trick when they discovered on the, when they did the catheterization, I have a genetic anomaly on my left ventricle. I have what are called collateral vessels that don't belong there, little side roads basically. So although my main highway got blocked, those little side roads kept enough blood flowing to the top of my ventricle that I didn't die. <laughs> And as every medical professional who has met me has said, after they understand my story, they say, I've never met anyone like you. I've never heard of this before. Or the one nurse that said, well, you must have something else that you need to do because you're still here. So I, I got a do-over, right? If you play the kind of games I did, you may not. And so my message is listen to your body because I didn't. When weird things happen, don't just say you're getting older. Go to a doctor. They train their whole damn lives to help you sort out what's like, oh, you're just, your back's supposed to hurt. You're getting old. Your, your spine sucks. It's terrible design. You know, you know your, your spine is going to hurt. That's normal. Or, oh, no, this bloating on your legs? No, we need to check that. Because if I had any point in my symptoms had gone and had listened to my wife, this could have been caught and I would have suffered a lot less. And if I'd gone to the hospital when I had the initial symptoms, none of this would have happened. So there's this line between stoic and hypochondriac, right? You don't want to be the person who's constantly fussing about everything, but you don't want to be like me, the idiot who denies everything and now is kind of stuck with this sort of mess, right? So, so choose wisely, right? Because, you know, I... I made my choice, and I have to live with my choices, right? Um, but I wish, in the end, that I had chosen differently. And that's that. Okay. I'm going to show you. That's, that's a very moving story. It, I've had uh, lots of different experiences with uh, Eric, including going to the bars uh, at night with students, and uh, Eric, he's a spiritual guy and takes care of people. So I have a just story to tell you very really quickly something that he did. So my cousin uh, married a guy who was in the Navy. And this guy went into the Navy like out of high school. And uh, after 20 years, he has an incident, I guess as high as he got, uh, decided to leave. But his dream was to go to the University of Michigan. Well, he was really not ready to for academically to go to the University of Michigan. So um, I called Eric and got uh, the two of them together, and Eric uh, arranged for him to go to Schoolcraft Junior College. And if he got those grades for two years, is it? Yeah, he would then be eligible at Michigan. Well, he is now a very proud U of M Michigan student. So that's the kind of output that Eric does. Let's give him a hand for that. Thank you.